Okay, good morning. So this is a rebroadcast of uh, our discussion about mapping. And uh, so hopefully everything will work and we're good to go. So this is a rebroadcast of uh, Wednesday, 26 January. Mapping genomes. So this is the third of, of well, three parts of our discussion. So off we go. So we've been covering these five outlined parts. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you examples of the a couple of types of the maps. And so we're going to start off with one of the older molecular maps called the restriction fragment length polymorphisms. We'll conclude with uh, sequence tag site maps and that'll be it for chapter three. So restriction mapping. So as a reminder, restriction enzymes cut DNA. Uh, another name for restriction enzymes are, of course, uh, endonucleases, right? And so what these enzymes do for bacteria is that they cut foreign DNA. And, and of course, what we've discovered is that, look, if a sequence that's recognized by the particular restriction enzyme is present, these endonucleases will cut any DNA. And so um, that's why they've been, they revolutionized molecular biology when they were discovered. And the exception to cutting any DNA, as it turns out, is if the DNA is methylated. So again, thinking of those, the cytosine that a methyl group's been added. So keep that in mind as we kind of move through here. The DNA can't be methylated, but is outside of that, it's accessible to endonuclease activity. Okay, so again, restriction enzymes uh, recognize specific DNA sequences. So that's uh, our second key principle of molecular biology or molecular technology. Um, they cut in a variety of ways. So some of them will cut both strands. Some of them only cut single strands. They'll, some of them will cut both strands straight across. Others will cut so that there's a hanging uh, uh, cut. And so depending on what uh, the goal is, you can mix and match these enzymes, not just because of the restriction sites that they recognize, but also about the product that they will re return. And again, since the 70s, when these were discovered, there's now more than 800 that are known and a significant number are available for purchase. Okay. So these are examples of some of the, the sequences that, that a uh, restriction enzyme might recognize. And so we've also made the point that in addition to different sequence recognized, um, some of the enzymes will cut you know, um, at a four base message or a six base message, etc. Okay, and eco R1, which is shown right down here, is, is a very common uh, enzyme to use, one of the first ones that was discovered. I mentioned that uh, the technology's been around for quite a while, and so um, it's kind of a cute little segue so i gave you a link to uh, the and there you can see it's on youtube if you just type in jurassic park mr dna it is a really corny little uh video which it was designed to be corny um but it, it actually explains a little bit and and uh, uh for your amusement i certainly recommend it okay um what are the restriction enzymes used for well definitely working with plasmids. So plasmids, you know, again, we use them to uh, clone uh, DNA from, from one source, put it into a, a vector, you know, the plasmids, and then get the plasmids into bacteria and grow them up. And that's a way of amplifying DNA, particularly developing uh, uh, a library of different genome fragments but they can also be used for a variety of other things. Um, so we're going to use restriction enzymes in basically two ways. And the first way, uh, it's a strategy. So this is talking about the first way, which is we're going to digest DNA 
and then have you assemble the fragments when once they've been separated on on a gel and it's kind of an old school technology people don't really do that anymore but it, it's a nice way a, a good segue into moving into the bioinformatics where of course you have databases and sequences and you're pulling them out and then you're doing assembly on these fragments okay it's nice to have a you know a hands-on approach to it so basically for this kind of, of mapping the goal is to get fragments separated on on a gel measure out the fragments and then be able to assemble those fragments back into a, a, a map of the restriction sites right Okay, so we'll start this up uh, in, in probably next week. We'll, we'll do that since we're just now back from our, our remote sessions. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through an experiment. And we'll say that we have two fragments that have been, uh, uh, you know, pulled out of a genome. And we... We want to check to see if these fragments are adjacent to each other or if they overlap. You know, and that's kind of the basic idea of building um, um, a map is you want to, you're going to get tons of fragments when you cut up a genome. And so you have to develop a procedure to kind of identify where those fragments come from. So one of the things you do is you look for landmark sequences or markers, and so there's some techniques for that. But the other thing you can do is you can apply restriction enzymes, and to the extent that the two fragments actually overlap each other, as in they're coming from the same region, then the information about the cuts will help you uh, determine whether the two fragments come from the same place or not. So, for this experiment, uh, four enzymes are used, and these are the, the sequences that they recognize. Notice that all of them generate an overhang as the cut. Okay. All right, so this is a pretty complicated slide, but the idea is that we digested the fragments, and we digested them as single enzymes. So, so we have a tube 1, which was EcoR1 for clone A, 2 for PS2-1, a third for BAM H1, and a fourth for Hindi 3. And then over on clone B, so tube 5, that's the EcoR1, 6, PST1, 7, BAM H1, and finally 8, the Hindi 3, okay? And certainly along this, when you're going to run the gel, you're going to want to have a ladder, right, a molecular standard. And so we run this, and so this down here is called the die front. These arrows are, are supposed to be down in the gel, but during a formatting, something got lost here, so ignore those two side arrows. Sorry about that. Okay, so... So we've run our gel, and we've made visual the bands, and we can now go proceed to analyze the bands. And so this is a procedure you call gel documentation. And you can use software for this, but, but there still is a substantial amount of hand work that you can do. So it's, it's good to kind of go through this. So what we're looking for is to, re is to rationalize first how many times was the fragment cut by the enzyme. So, looking at EcoR1, tube 1, we only see one band. So, how many times was clone A cut by EcoR1? Well, the answer is zero times. So, and if you can see, the idea is that the band corresponds to the 8 kilobase uh, ladder marker. So, that's well, that's how large the fragment was to begin with. So, trick answer. We see a, you know, one band. So, how many times was the enzyme cutting the DNA? Well, the answer is zero. And right to the, the other part here, looking at clone B, we find that Hindi 3 didn't cut the fragment at all. So, again, giving us our 10 KB size. So, for clone B, 
the zero cutter was ND3 for clone A. The zero cutter was eco R1. So then the idea is just proceeding through the bands and assigning the, the bands to the size, but also how many times was this cut. So we've got one, two, three bands. So how many times did the enzyme cut? The answer is two. Two bands for BAM H1. How many times did it cut clone A? The answer is one. So you can see a pattern here. The number of bands minus one gives you the number of cut sites. Okay, so getting the size of the bands, well, obviously the idea is we're looking to that ladder, but if you'll notice, the ladder is not, you know, sort of equidistance. And so the movement of the fragments through the gel is sort of a curved linear. The smaller fragments, of course, travel faster through the gel. Right? So here's the ladder was loaded in well one. Tube one is the, this is where the well is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have some things that we can measure distances from. So the RF value is defined as the distance from the well to the band, and then you divide the distance from the band to the die front. Okay, and so that gives you the total movement. And that's called the RF, and then you plot that. Of course, our standards, we know the, the, the sizes. This is uh, a different ladder. It's not the same one, but it gives you the same idea. The distance traveled, right? So, okay, so these are in general, these kind of calibration curves are called Ferguson plots. Okay, so at any rate, we would proceed to do this by hand, right? It takes, it takes us a while. And so, uh, there they are. Okay, so I'm just kind of getting ahead of myself here. So this is, ah, come on, this is uh, some R code. So R is a free s statistical software package. Uh, you can run it on, in Jupyter Notebooks and Google's CoLab or in CoCalc. Um, we use R in, in this course a little bit. Um, you'll use R in other courses, and of course uh, you'll use it in biostatistics quite a bit. So this looks fairly complicated, I understand, but this turns out to be a much easier thing to do than, say, trying to calculate these things from uh, uh, in Excel. So basically, just let me give you a kind of heads up here. So we need two variables, right? So one of them is the distances that were measured for the, and then the other is the base pairs for the, the ladder. So we uh, combined our list into this object distance, combined our other list into the object called BP. And then I put it together in what's, what R calls a data frame, but it's just like basically building a worksheet in Excel. And I'll, unimaginably, we'll call it my data. And then I attach the data. It's just a little technical trick that you do in R to make sure that the variables are easily accessible. And then most of you know something about drawing a line, right? And so it's called a linear regression. But for situations like this, you can clear clearly see why there's a you know small small fragments right travel the greatest distance but it's not a completely linear relationship and so there's a variety of ways of handling that uh, but one of the nicer ways now is to use what's called a non-parametric local regression technique or a LOAS function and basically what it does is it smooths out and then draws the curve, and then we can get the equation for that. So the point about a calibration curve, right, is that, of course, you have a standard where you know the number of base pairs, and you measure out the distance that they travel during that particular trial run of your electrophoresis. And then once you have that equation, you can plug in the distance traveled by your unknown band or your sample band, Okay, and then use the equation to predict what the unknown base pairs are. And so just, I drew a, a red dot here, and this, these are the commands, how to make the plot, how to add the blue line, and then finally how to add the, re add the red dot so that you can see. So at the end of the day, the way, of course, to do this by hand is that you just take your, 
your ruler straight edge or something and you'd take the point here and where does it intersect the x-axis at 22 and then you interpolate here between 50 and 60 and so you're going to come out with uh, about 53 okay so the, the answer is what's the the size of our unknown it's 53 base pairs okay so I mentioned that there's software out there there's there's a variety of options this is a uh, uh, program that somebody wrote uh, called gel analyzer and it's free they also have a, a phone app and, and it works kind of okay but the idea is that you know you have to then it, there you'll run some algorithms and it'll try to select your your lanes and you define one of them as the ladder and then you will then click on the bands as you go through and so it'll give you this graph on the right which you can see shows you the peaks okay so this is a pretty useful way of recognizing the gel and so then that those peak values are then transported into the spreadsheet and gives you the Ferguson plot plus the equation okay so which is quicker doing it by hand or doing it by uh, image analysis and the answer is it's quicker by hand but the advantage of doing it in the software is that the software saves all the steps for you and so it's repeatable okay so at any rate here's our results and this is a table that you might generate right you know number of cuts your estimated size fragments based on the cuts okay and so then the next step what you're going to try to do is build your map and so what you would do of course is assemble the fragments and you're looking for regions of overlap so we have PST1 PST1 here we have two cuts here so those pieces are going to have to slide over so that this part here the first BST1 cut and clone B is going to match the first cut in PST1 over on clone A and then of course it's like you're going to get three point matches right you're going to get PST1 BAM H1 PST1 of clone B matching up with clone A's PST1 BAM H1 PST1 right and how do I know where this goes well okay we know that there was no cutting of of clone B by Hindi 3 so the 5 prime end here slides all the way over to where Hindi 3 cuts clone A and so the point on clone B where eco R1 cuts must be the end fragment of our 8 kilobase kilo clone A because again eco 1 didn't cut clone A so this isn't a particularly challenging one there's our, our regions of overlap okay and we basically now can show that the the fragments clone A and clone B are in fact coming from uh, a, a similar region in the genome um, not completely identical they're overlapping and so this is really great information we wouldn't want you know if they are completely the same that doesn't really extend our map but we now have restriction sites mapped for this what is it uh, 12 <coughs> excuse me 12 KB fragment and we have landmarks now where the restriction enzymes cut so at any rate that's the basic idea of this style of uh, restriction mapping finding the restriction sites taking fragments and, and extending the the sequence information by over finding overlapping regions okay so here's a practical area of RFLP mapping um, okay so what are these these organisms well obviously they're deer all right and so they look the same to me but these are the so-called white-tailed deer so there's the little white tail and then there's the black-tailed deer and and so it's like that seems like a pretty superficial difference but the question is are they in fact the same species and then just sort of different you know 
different kinds, diversity of deer types, or are these actually different species? And so, you know, the the definition, Ernst Meyer's biological species concept certainly applies here. The question would be if you put them together, the deer, um, do they end up having kids, viable hybrids? And in turn, are those hybrid kids able to have kids themselves? And if they are, then that's pretty much indicating that they are the same species. But it you know, not having that evidence, can you do something molecular to to at least further our our saying that these are the same species or two different species? So your hypothesis, your null hypothesis is is that they're actually the same and that there's the differences are minor. So test that by throwing in some restriction enzymes, obviously the same restriction enzymes, and then trying to find regions in which you have overlapping. And so uh, the black-tailed deer generated fewer bands. Okay, but so here's C, here's A, okay, here's X. Okay, so we can see there are certainly, re oh, so A and B, that's different. All right, there's not a complete overlap. There's, in fact, many more sites in the white-tailed deer than there are in the black-tailed deer. So, again, while this doesn't prove that they are two different species, it's certainly shifting the evidence towards the direction that there are different species because there's substantial genetic differences between them. Okay. Okay, so the other uh, mapping technique is not really a mapping technique per se, but it is using restriction enzymes that happen to fall within single nucleotide polymorphism areas in the genome as a way of generating a quick test to see if uh, two individuals share the same type or not. Okay, and so, uh, you know, there's if you kind of search out in Google and you do the RFLP mapping as part of your search, you'll invariably see comments like, well, this is an old technique and nobody really does it. And of course, that's very human research centered because it's true for human sequences. Of course, we have the, res the reference genome sequence to work with. So therefore, you don't need to do techniques like this with humans. You still can, but there are other alternatives for you. But for many, many organisms, the amount of genome sequencing that's been done is, is, can be quite small. So if you want to do genotyping, why, <laughs> why make the effort to, to sequence the entire genome when all you're really interested in is maybe a particular gene and whether or not uh, two individuals share the same copy or not? And so if you can find a restriction site within that target area, um, this is a, a really easy way of identifying variants. So this is, we'll step you through this here. Okay, so this is from a, a 2017 book and, or, or article. So that's pretty recent, and it already goes against the whole point about saying, well, there's no reason to do this technique with humans. So this is a researching uh, this gene on chromosome 19, and this SNP, so R stands for reference, and S stands for SNP, and the number is good grief, right? It's a database number, okay? And so what they had noticed is that there seems to be an association between having a G at the SNP versus having a T, okay? And so there's the, the sequence. So they developed some primers to amplify the region, and then they put the target fragment into a, uh, they sequenced it, and they identified a restriction site. Okay, so the restriction site is contained in the region that contains the SNP. And what they're trying to do is, to, is figure out if, you know, one person has this genotype and the other person has the same or a different genotype. And the presence absence of the restriction enzyme 
as well because of the SNP itself. Okay, so the off we go. So this should look sim similar, right? This is a gel, and what we've got here is we've got our ladder, and we have our individuals who were, were interested in identifying the SNP. So the presence absence of the restriction site, okay, gives us information on the gel. So where it was not cut, okay, so that we would then interpret the individual's homozygous for the SNP with the TT variant. Individual two generated two bands in that region. And again, you, you predict these, right? And so this individual must be heterozygous. They have one copy of the uh, more common SNP variant. And they have the, uh, the other copy as well, which is why, there we go, you have these two bands. And then finally, individual three is homozygous for the uh, more rare SNP, okay? So this is much quicker than sending out for sequencing. You develop a routine, um, and it was used for identifying human variants restriction fragments being digested and put onto a gel. Okay, so STS mapping, sequence tag sites, right? So sequence tag sites are, are a more general kind of landmark, right? Because compared to restriction enzymes, the, the, the target is that sequence, that particular sequence, and STS can include um, all kinds of other things. Right? An example is the ESTs. STS, example EST. What's an EST? The first few sequences or, or base pair sequences, you know, 100 to a few hundred of the start or the end of a cDNA. The cDNA, of course, corresponds to the messenger RNA. So if you're doing express sequence tag mapping, what are you getting? The location of protein coding genes. Okay, just a reminder. Okay. So extending from that, this is the idea of, of locating sequences within the genome, so you are anchoring landmarks to the genome. Um, this is uh, an older technology again, um, publish express sequence tags, they're in the, you know, well over 100 million are, are now in the databases, so uh, you can get sequence tags basically covering virtually the entire genome so that allows you to, to identify you know finer scale on your map right the idea of like taking an aerial photograph of oahu and zooming in and then pinpointing the things that you can see on the map so the difference between you know locating cities and towns on oahu down to neighborhoods within cities down to you know block by block down to identifying stores and homes by address right uh, that's the fine scale approach of the SDS mapping as a reminder cDNA sequencing you could instead of you know working with ESTs you can sequence the entire cDNA compare that to the EST maps, and that allows you to start locating intron exon borders. So, again, going finer scale within our, our identifying landmarks within the genome. Uh, reminder you can make a cDNA library I'm going for messenger RNAs, single stranded DNA, that's reverse transcriptase. 
add DNA polymerase and of course your substrates to make double-stranded DNA and so you now have a cDNA put it into a plasmid put it into a bacteria and you now store that in your minus 80 freezer and you have a ready source of of that fragment and you build this up by the tens of thousands depending on the number of genes that you're going after right okay so true or false the primary structure so sequence of eukaryotic cDNA corresponds to the primary structure of the gene we'll take a moment and let you think about that okay so on your exam I will give you true false questions and of course if you're only given the option true or false usually in biology you should answer false a, a, a clue that you might want to answer true is if the a sentence gets really really long because I make the joke about in biology is that we like to make these general you know principled statements about how biology works but you the more you learn about biology you should recognize that the answer is always diversity right that that there's lots of ways of doing the same thing um, and not everybody's the same and so that sort of that translates at all levels of biology and so it's hard to write true statements in biology because there seems to be lots of exceptions right and so in any way you can think of a statement is false anyway you should always answer false so what I've developed over the years is that I'll give you the choice you can say why the statements true so it's true false or and explained tell me why you made the choice I ask on the exam for you to make a call you can't say well it's both true and false no that's not true <laughs> if you can think of a way it's false then the answer is false and explain why it's false if it's true you have to make a case for it and so you could make a case that it's like well uh, in humans for example this is false because we can think that the vast majority of protein coding genes of course have introns so therefore the cDNA doesn't correspond one-to-one -to, -one to the gene because of course cDNA lacks the introns it also lacks the promoter and enhancer elements but you could say true before the thousand or so genes in humans that lack introns that they're just simply a continuous sequence I put in the word eukaryote so you you're supposed to think about eukaryotes humans are eukaryotes um, but this would be true if I scratched out eukaryote and said prokaryote because typically genes in you in prokaryotes don't have introns at all so anyway the point is is that this is a uh, I've gotten around the, the limitation of true false questions by asking you to explain and defend yourself. Okay, so we'll just kind of go through this, this last couple of slides here pretty quickly. Um, just as a reminder what ESTs are used for. They're, they're useful for mapping, okay, and then making visual. So if you add Oh, if you make the ESTs probes right and, and visualize them then you can locate these to the chromosomes so that's always nice to do um, you could also sequence the ESTs and then if there's a reference genome you can then grab that from the database and find where they are so that's good um, that that validates the use of the EST as a probe for example because people have generated so many ESTs just like our restriction fragment length mapping of clone A and clone B you should expect that many of the ESTs are coming from the same region in the genome so you can get overlapping and that starts building your 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 details of the genome area and then also ESTs are useful for designing probes for DNA microarrays and we'll talk about DNA microarrays quite a bit throughout the semester 
Okay, so the last pit, pit? No, bit that we're going to cover is the idea of using these mapping techniques to narrow down uh, and identify in the genome the location of a particular gene. So the procedures are, are basically the same. You're going to extract DNA. Uh, well, actually, again, we're going to make this from RNA, right? We're going to, going to get our cDNA and we're going to get our ESTs from the cDNA. So you begin by extracting RNA because, of course, you know that the presence of RNA means that, that, reg that a region of the genome has been transcribed. That's the definition of our gene functional region yeah okay all right hybridation text te test can determine if a fragment contains transcribes yes okay so good um, all right so basically the end result is what we're going to do is we're going to dump these back into the genome and look for hits okay so the presence absence categorical data about the probe hybridizes with the genome or it doesn't and then you have to make it visual some way right okay so this is our our genome and we collect our C DNAs from the messenger RNAs that are transcribed and we sequence those C DNAs and so we get at least some of the captured regions of the original gene just a database uh, copy number from like 1998 uh, okay um, ESTs are used quite a bit in the, the ENCODE project and then this is the graphic uh, of putting it all together so we're in this region right here right we got the cDNAs and we have the ESTs so the other thing that you can do, of course, is that if you actually know the protein and you have the sequence for the protein, you can predict what the DNA sequence must have been. Um, I have a mention here about codon bias. The problem with going from protein back to, to RNA and then to DNA, of course, is that the genetic code is redundant. And so even though you have you know, these sequences of amino acids, some of those amino acids can be coded for in multiple ways and so you don't really know which the correct RNA sequence you can get a hint though because people have tabulated well how often do those redundant codes show up you know in humans so we'll talk about codon bias a little bit in lab it's part of our our, our big uh, bioinformatics project Okay, at any rate there, by combining, uh, using bioinformatic techniques, like if you do know some sequence, um, you can identify structures, so like a sequence motif, by looking at the RNA sequences, and you can use your cDNA information, combine all that together, and you can start mapping out the location of that gene, including whether or not they, uh, they have multiple introns uh, by looking at cDNA and ESTs you can start identifying the, the borders between the exons and the introns and so on and so forth okay so that concludes the January 26 review so I thank you for listening <laughs>